Jacob's Pillar. You may have noticed uh, in the front of our hall we have our display boards up and one of the display boards is called Jacob's Pillar, the Stone of Destiny or the Stone of Scone and we're just going to cover a little bit about why that board is there and what it's about and some of the history of the stone and as we go through I hope you see that it's a um, it's actually quite an amazing prophecy and a fulfilment of prophecy. Not that the stone is, uh, we don't want to be sort of worshipping a stone or anything silly like that, but it is significant and it represents a lot more than just a rock under the, the coronation chair. Okay, so where did it all come from? Back in <coughs> Genesis chapter 28, we read a story, and it's a significant story in the Old Testament, it's a story of where Jacob laid down and rested his head and had a dream. Now this dream was a, a major dream because it was a dream about a relationship between heaven and earth. And as we read through the chapter, uh, you know, you'll see some interesting promises that are made and we're going to try and follow those promises a little bit. And they're significant because these promises related to Jacob who was um, Abraham's grandson. So Genesis 28, we see here from verse 10 it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran, and he lighted, upon a cert, or lighted on a cert, certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows, and, lay, uh, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up upon the earth, and on top of it it reached to heaven, and behold, angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Now this is an artist's rendition there, but essentially what he dreamed about was this ladder going up to the heavens, and angels going up and down on this ladder. Now we all know that you know, that's, that's just a, it's a very symbolic concept, but this is, this is his dream anyway. But... The dream goes on, it says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. Isaac, of course, was Jacob's father. The land whereon thou lies, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. Now I want you to remember that. This statement from God in this dream is that this stone was going to be God's house. Which is an odd thing to say. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give, thee the, give the tenth unto thee. Now this is... This occurred in 1760 BC. Now what I want to just point out here quickly is verse 14 when it says, Thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. Essentially what occurred subsequent to this was that Jacob, uh, he had 12, 12 boys. One of those boys was Joseph. Joseph was sold off into slavery and went down into Egypt. And there came a famine upon the earth that was pretty bad, and the rest of the family of, ja of Jacob's family all ended up going down to Egypt because Egypt had food, because Joseph had been forewarned by God that there was going to be a drought, and he had stockpiled lots of food in Egypt. And when his family went down there, uh, they were reunited with Joseph. Joseph was in a position of power and gave his brethren um, residence down there in Egypt, and they stayed there. Uh, eventually until the Egyptians, another pharaoh came along who really didn't have any relationship with um, Joseph and his family, put them under bondage for 430 years and that takes us right up till the time of Moses when Moses led the children of Israel out of via the Red Sea across back into their homeland, back in this area. So the promise where he was going to move them to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south never happened in ja Jacob's lifetime. It happened to his descendants. And the, the above verse there, um, sorry, the next verse that says, and these, 
in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's speaking particularly about Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, he came as a descendant of David. And David was a descendant of, ja of Jacob. And it was through David's seed that Jesus came. That's why Jesus, when he walked around sometimes, that people said to him, you're you know, the son of David. He was, if you go through Matthew chapter 1 about Mary's lineage, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, you'll find that Mary was a direct descendant of King David. So in Galatians, when it talks about these promises, it actually um, singles out Jesus as being the fulfilment of this, um, you know, through, J through Abraham's seed and through Isaac and Jacob's seed, would all the world be blessed through Jesus. But as well as just that the blessings that came through Jesus, also Jacob's descendants were going to migrate to the four corners of the earth. And this is exactly what happened. Now this is 28 years later. In chapter 35 of Genesis we read this. This is now uh, a, uh, an event where Jacob actually wrestled with an angel. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel, which means ruling with God, shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall come out of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So now there's uh, an extension of the promises, where God is actually building on the, those ones that were given 28 years earlier, where he's saying not only is he going to spread from the north and the south, the east and the west, and, it's, and all nations are going to be blessed through his seed, but also they're actually going to be a nation and a company of nations. And also that, that there would be kings that would, be, that would come through his line, which is interesting because at this stage there were no kings. When this was written in Genesis 35, there were no kings in Israel. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering there, uh, thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke to, with him Bethel. Now Bethel actually means in Hebrew, house of God. And Bethel is the place also where Jacob had that dream. So we're talking about a particular place here that was very significant in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it was significant because <coughs> in this place, Jacob had set up this pillar that was representative of these promises that were given to him. Not that the pillar was particularly significant, but the promises were. And this is what I'm getting at here. All throughout the Old Testament, this stone that they carried around with them was representative or embodied these promises. So it's held as dear to Israel because... It signified these, these amazing promises that God had given to Jacob and his descendants. Now here in Genesis 49, we read this. Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow. Remember I said Joseph was one of Jacob's children? And this Joseph was the one through whom the, the major promises of um, being a company of nations and a na great nation would come. And Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well, whose branches run over the well. The archers have sorely grieved him, and shot at him, and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Now, from these verses here, as a result of these promises that were given to Joseph and these descriptions... Descriptions were also given to each of the other brothers of the tribes of Israel. And as a result of these promises, emblems or shields or banners were, were created to represent each of the tribes. And Joseph's uh, emblem was of the um, branches, the olive, the, the olive branches. And that was his emblem. And we'll, we'll see that that's significant as well. Not tonight so much, but... They, these emblems that were given to them carry through time uh, eventually to his descendants. Now, going right down now to 1000 BC, I just wanted to throw this in as well, just to, just to illuminate the concept of this house of God. 
and what it represented. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 8. This is now written in 1000 BC when Israel at the, are at the height of their power and they are at their, mass, their greatest extent. David is king and they have now swallowed up all of the area around them. And this is where the nation of Israel has been, been now given all of the land that was promised, promised to Abraham. Now therefore... So that thou shalt, uh, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Remember we read earlier that kings would come of his line? And I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Now this is where it gets interesting here. Can you imagine King David hearing these words? Because David now, Israel, is exactly where all the promises said they would be. But the one thing that hasn't happened yet is that they haven't become a company of nations, they haven't become a great nation, and they haven't become, uh, haven't gone to the north, the south, and the east, and the west. Verse 10 it says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as, uh, and as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord tells thee that he will make thee a house, or an house. Because what had happened here, David said, I want to build God a house to dwell in. Because David wanted to build a temple. And God said to David, no, I'm not going to let you build a temple because you're a man of war. Uh, your son will build me the temple. And eventually Solomon, his son, did build a temple. But he said to David, no, I'm, I don't want you to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. Talking about the house of David and eventually this kingdom that would last forever. And when thy days shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy father, or when you die, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So he's talking about Solomon and so on, down through the line. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this is talking about David's throne, being around forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. In other words, if the descendants of King David did not follow God's commandments and do the wrong thing, God would punish them. He would allow other nations, like I said here, the rod of men with the stripes of the children of men, he would allow other nations to inflict David's descendants because of that. But the kingdom would remain nonetheless. And we saw that subsequent to David, that different kings were, uh, had fallen into idolatry and done things quite, you know, some pretty bad um, things where the prophets would often plead to God saying, get rid of this king. And the, God's response was, look, uh, because of my promise to David, the king remains, but I will punish them for, for what they've done. But the kingdom still remained. Verse 15, But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established again forever. Before thee thy throne shall be established forever. So I think we're getting the point here of this chapter, that the throne will remain forever. Now, in Exodus chapter 17, we read this, Behold, I will stand before thee, there, this is Moses now, uh, stand there upon the rock of, in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and uh, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now what I'm getting at here is this rock that they carried around with them was a significant stone. And this is the stone upon which Jacob rested his head. It became symbolic of these promises. So wherever they went, they carried with them this stone. And in the Old Testament, the kings were crowned standing beside this stone. We'll see that later. Now, in reference to this, in the New Testament, in Corinthians, Paul writes this. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were all under this cloud and all passed through the sea, 
and were all baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, or anointed. So what we're getting at here is this rock was symbolic of all these promises. That's why it literally wasn't Christ. The rock wasn't Christ, but it was representative of the promises. Are we, are we starting to see that? It's, it's the language, although it's a bit odd for today, in today's vernacular, the point is that this rock that they carried around was a significant thing to the nation of Israel, and that's why they carried it around and gave it such a prominent place. Now, this is in 1450 BC. Now, this is what the, the angel said to Mary when Mary was uh, about to have a baby. In Luke 1.31 it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Isn't it significant that the angel, when the angel appears to Mary, the angel says, call his name Jesus, and then goes on about how that Jesus is going to sit on this throne of David. Can we see why it's so significant now that this throne remained forever? But we still have a problem, don't we? In 604 BC, the city of Jerusalem was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar and the king Zedekiah was taken away prisoner. So many would say that from 604 BC to when this, when Jesus came along, in, in, uh, when Jesus was born, around about 4 BC, for those 600 years, that there was no king in Israel. And that was the claim. So a lot of people between 600 BC and 4 BC were skiting and saying, look, uh, God's promises faltered. You know, all these promises that... There would always be a king over Israel. Never came true. But it is true because what happened was Zedekiah had also daughters, and the daughters were taken by Joseph, oh sorry, by um, Jeremiah the prophet away at, at the time that Nebuchadnezzar took the city of Nebu uh, took the city of Jerusalem, and they went down into Egypt. In a couple of weeks, we're going to do a presentation just on that aspect. But one of the things that Jeremiah took with him was this stone upon which Jacob rested his head. And that's, what, that's, that's where it gets interesting. Now, pretty bright, but the stone of destiny is a stone that appeared in a place called Tara in Ireland in 580 BC. Now it just so happens in 586 BC, was when Joseph, sorry, I keep saying Joseph, Jeremiah fled the city of Jerusalem with the princesses down into Egypt. And six years later, this man with these princesses turned up in a place called Tara in Ireland. It wasn't called Tara then, but in those days, there was already a person who was there called Eokade, who was a heroine or a king. And when this person turned up with, with, in Phoenician boats, with a person named Barak, not Barack Obama kids, uh, in 580 BC, one of these princesses married this person, Eokade. And their, their son was actually crowned king, sitting on this throne, or this stone, sorry, that was brought over by this patriarch that they called. They called him the patriarch. The actual Hebraic word was Olam Fodler, and it means the patriarch. And he built a university there and he stayed there for some time. The girl, the princess that was with him, was buried in this place, Tara, and is still there today. It's the only archaeological dig in, in Ireland that is banned by law for anyone to actually ex excavate. So it's a, it's a hill, it's a mound over there where this princess is buried. But anyway, they brought this stone with them and their son was crowned on this stone. And for several centuries, this stone remained there with the descendants of this Eokade and his, the daughter, Teotifi, her name was. And then in 787 AD, the stone was taken from Ireland, uh, from Tara in Ireland, over to a place called, initially Carrickfergus, and then down to a place called Scone in Scotland. 
and this stone became known as the Stone of Scone. And from from all that time, from 1296, <coughs> oh, sorry, from 787 through the 1296, all the kings of Scotland were crowned on this stone. I've got history books at home that talk about this. Remember the movie Braveheart a few years ago? Yep. I've got a, a history book from 1837 at home where it talks about William Wallace. And William Wallace remarks about how he was um, uh, wanted to go down and, and rescue the stone and bring it back to Scone from the, uh, from the English because it was um, the stone on which Jacob rested his head and he wanted it back in Scotland. So even back then, even back in the 1830s, it was common knowledge, it was part of the history books that this stone was the, the stone on which Jacob rested his head. Now in Ezekiel chapter 21 we read this, talking about the throne. It says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more, or no more overturned, until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it him. Speaking of Jesus. So what the prophecy was concerning here was how the, that God was going to take away the throne. The verses preceding this, it says, remove the diadem, take off the crown, it shall not be the same. You know, and then goes on and says this, that the throne is going to be overturned, overturned three times before staying in a place where eventually when Jesus Christ, Christ comes back again, he's going to come back and claim this throne. And we see now, from 1296 AD, James VI of Scotland became James I of England, and the stone rested in Westminster Abbey, and all the kings of England were then crowned on this stone. I thought it would be interesting to talk today to do because the Queen arrived today. <laughs> I thought it'd be... Is that stone still in Westminster? No, they, they took it out a few years ago and took it back to Edinburgh. Um, Whereabouts? Uh, Edinburgh Castle. Castle. Oh, they took it. They took it back there just, uh, I guess, for tourists and uh, oh. and the Scottish one. A few years ago, the Scottish tried to steal it. Oh. Uh, but if there's any, if for example, Queen Elizabeth dies and they and they make King Charles, uh, uh, Prince Cup Charles the King, then they will take the, the stone back to the coronation chair and he will be crowned on that stone, as were his mother and all the kings before okay. him. <laughs> Oh, incidentally, by the way, there's the um, British coat of arms there. Along the bottom it says, Due mon doigt, which means God and my right, or God and my birthright. That birthright is a birthright starting from Jacob, going down, right down through, um, through Jacob's seed, right down with the prom carrying the promises to today. So over in, in Scone, they've now got a replica, you can see it there of the, uh, the stone which the kings of Scotland were crowned on what's called Moot Hill until 1296 when Edward I took the stone to Westminster Abbey. Sure. Now, in, at the turn of the century there was some talk about this stone and they had a royal commission in England to establish the origin of several of the historical monuments in England. And there's a book called The Royal Commission into the Historical Monuments of England, an inventory of the historical monuments in London, Westminster, Westminster Abbey, where in the foreword we read this. No better occasion than this will offer itself for introducing a word about the strange palladium of the empire, the Stone of Scone, which Edward I brought from Scotland and placed it in the coronation chair, which he made to hold it, which holds we're told still. What was it? The medieval chroniclers, as it is well known, made it to, to be Jacob's pillow at Bethel and told of its transportation to Ireland and thanks, thanks to Scotland. So this is what they said in the foreword concerning the stone, was that this, this had been the case, that the stone had been brought over. Palladium just means a strange object with which the security of something is regarded as bound up. So this is what they're saying, that the security of Britain was all bound up in what was represented by this stone, or the promises that were contained, or that were given when Jacob rested his head upon this stone. Okay. Again, there's that verse out of uh, Genesis 49, when it speaks about this shepherd stone, the stone of Israel. In the memorials of Westminster Abbey, we read this, the one primeval monument which binds together the whole empire carries back 
our thoughts to races and customs now almost extinct, a link which in, unites the throne of England to the traditions of Tara and Iona. Tara is um, obviously that place back where the princess was buried. It is traditionally identified with Jacob's pillow at, at Bethel, afterwards the Leophail or Stone of Destiny on the sacred hill of Tara in Ireland. So you can see there a picture there, that's what the stone looked like under the coronation chair. So if you went to Westminster Abbey over the years and saw the stone, that's what you would have found under the stone. Oh sorry, under the, under the chair. Out of 2 Kings we read this, And he brought forth the king's son, and he put the crown upon him, and gave him the testimony, or the, the Old Testament law, and they made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. This is the, the tradition there out of the Old Testament. We, and this is what they do in, nowadays with Princess Elizabeth there. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Now that scripture there in Kings goes on to say this. Verse 13 and 14. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord, and when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was. So at the coronation there in the Old Testament, they stood by the pillar, which was represented this stone or this these promises. Again, these are the promise that the, the words of the angel to Jesus to uh, Jesus' mother Mary that he would take up the throne of his father David. Now here's another verse, a prophecy out of Isaiah chapter 9, which I think is really important to encapsulate exactly what it, what it all stands for. It's not that we're saying that Britain is particularly great or anything like that. But well, I'm hope, hopeful that I'll be able to clear that up very well now. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. From henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now this is just after, you know, just the verses preceding this, this is where uh, through the prophet Isaiah, he's talking about uh, Jesus and he says, Unto us a son shall be given, the governor shall be upon his head, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And then he goes on to say this, that God is going to establish his throne with judgment and justice for a particular purpose. And it's interesting those words together because we see that also in the promises that were given to Abraham. Back in Genesis 18 we read this, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. So we're talking about Abraham, Isaac and, and Jacob now. And remember, Jacob had these identical promises given to him that were just reiterated to him uh, uh, you know, several years after the promises were already given to Abraham. So you can see the, the wording is so similar to the wording that was given to Jacob. But interestingly, in verse 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he spoken of him. So this is what we're getting at here. God, The reason God chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was because God knew beforehand that, God, that the, the descendants of Abraham would bring justice and judgment in such a way as to facilitate the word of God going out to the world, to the north, the south, and the east, and the west, so that the gospel would go out as a schoolmaster, as we read down there in Galatians, as a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ, so that wherever the British Empire spread, they took with them the Old Testament law in the form of the Magna Carta and the Common Law, which was based on the Old Testament law and establish the, the law and the judgment and justice beforehand so that when the gospel went out, it was something that was receivable by people. If you go to China now and preach the gospel there, it's quite difficult because the people in China or Japan or a lot of countries where 
the, the Old Testament law didn't go beforehand as a plough to plough the ground, their comprehension and understanding of things like sin and judgment and the God of Abraham, the God who, who created everything, these concepts are quite foreign to them, so they find it difficult to understand repentance. So the law for the nation of Israel acted as a a plough that broke up the, the fallow ground and made the ground ready for the seed to come. That's what he was getting at back there when he spoke about his seed after him establishing in judgment and justice. So that God... So this is why when in Galatians we read this, it says that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Jesus was in fact the fulfilment of those blessings. But Israel, the nation, played an important role in that they went beforehand to prepare the ground. It makes real sense when you think about it. And God, in the Old Testament, established principles of sowing and reaping and harvest and ploughing the ground beforehand and when to sow and when to reap. And all this was a parable or a type of what he was doing with his word throughout the globe in the expansion of the word of God throughout the world. In verse 29, we read this. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it's not something that makes any difference whether you're of British descent or not. It makes no difference. The British Empire was really just used to, by God to prepare the ground ready so that the rest of the world could then be given the gospel. 